Greetings, my friend. Welcome to the secret shop. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the secret shop. I am Ian, and I'm joined by my original crew. Anger, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. And I'm also joined by Simon. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm well rested. Yeah, we had like in a couple of weeks off where, you know, one of you was gone, the other one week was gone. And like, it almost looked like I was going to be gone this week somehow, but we were able to stitch it together, all three of us on the cast at the same time, like the good old days. So mm. lovely to have you all here, all sorts of news to process and go through, though. But I wanted to start off with a warm up question. This is, this is what we do. I like doing it. It's a lot of fun for me. And the question that I had for you guys, and also if, you, if you're listening at home, like leave a comment if you have a question. It doesn't even have to necessarily be artifact related as a good, you know, get to know people kind of question. We'd love to have it. But the one that I have for you guys is what Dota character do you identify with the most? Do you think that like most suits you? I don't know nearly as much as you guys know about the, the Dota universe. So I'm sure that you guys can you have one in mind even already. But the one that like, uh, the one stuff that I know, the one who makes sense to me is Rubik. This, <laughs> yeah, like, that's huge. Twitchy, <laughs> oh, yeah. like, twitchy guy, like <laughs> kind of smart, but really can't focus on fucking anything. And yeah, just just making stuff up as he goes along. You know, like that. That seems like <laughs> me to to me. I I don't know. Um, but uh, but his anger seems to agree. Does that sound like uh, a fitting one for you, Simon? Uh, does sound good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does sound about right. What What about you? Is there any uh, Dota character that you think best suits you? I wish I was Invoker, but I'm probably just Ogre Magi. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why is that? Just just the the idea of uh, you know, brute forcing things down, or, or or what is it about the Ogre Magi that that appeals to you? Oh man, um, that was actually more of a joke. I think the hero that I play the most is uh, Lion. I don't know if I really identify with uh, one of them. No, I can um, see you being Lion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, something about hell and back. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about you, Anger? Wait, is there any German heroes? Um, I believe that uh, none of them have like a super obvious German accent, so I don't think so. I have Sven heard is someone... kind of a German name, right? It is. No, it's. I think well, it's more skin... Scandinavian, actually. Oh yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> you guys don't know you talk shit like... about my geographic knowledge. Yeah. Hey, hey, this here is comes Sven. here comes the American mixing up European countries. <laughs> no, no, okay. Go. You were here on the call for it, but anger was like, I was saying like, oh yeah, I'm from Ontario. And she's like, oh, that's like near Florida, right? I'm like, no, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> oh, no. A little no, bit no. off there. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, maybe she was confusing with Orlando, so I'll give her, give her that one. But what about you, Anger? What is the hero that you think that you maybe connect with in, in some way? Troll oh. Warlord. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, hmm. uh, I mean, Viper has the line of, I fly into a rage. <laughs> it's a little bit like you. Um, I don't know. I kind of, sometimes, you know, I feel like Pugna a little bit. <laughs> And sometimes, okay. you know, I feel like Axe. So I don't sure. know. I'm not sure. Um, some people say I'm. Uh, I resemble a Legion Commander. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah. But yeah, I don't yeah. know. I I think I'm a. I'm 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 not nearly as cunning as her. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. So with that, we are going to jump right into things. You know, the first topic that we have to to cover is actually about draft because one of the exciting things that came out this week is we got more information about how drafts work and also about mm -hmm. the composition of packs too really useful information uh some of that will bleed into some topics about the economy that we're not going to cover th today because i think that that's a bigger conversation but we do uh, have a bunch of information now about how draft functions and we also have somebody on the cast luckily who's played some of the draft so she can give us her impressions about how things ha have been going uh, with that and and how things work. So I'm going to read through a very short Reddit post that uh, Rob uh, A J G. You know, he's obviously I think people who have been following stuff a lot have seen his stuff come up, but he was the one who originally posted the information a week ago. But as we're recording this, he had five points as to how draft worked. First point: you are drafting packs with the same structure as real packs. Each real pack contains exactly one hero. 
Point two. On each pick, you draft two cards. This means there will be six picks per pack. And obviously, there are 12 card packs, if people don't recall that. And number three, currently, we are drafting five packs, which means that you are drafting a total of 50, uh, 60 cards then, I guess. Uh, which means that between that, like the 40 cards of your, your main deck and your item deck, you, you do have a number of spares there. Four, after each pick, the pack uh, and its remaining cards is thrown back into the pool of other packs that not only have the same number of cards, but are also on the same pack number in the draft. And number five, each player is guaranteed exactly one hero per pack. Thus, each player will end with five hero supplemented by the basic heroes. If you draft a hero on picks one through five, you cannot take a second hero. It will be grayed out. Uh, this ensures that you'll have enough heroes for uh, all players. And if you are on a pick six, you will have to be take a hero because the, there's only one of those left. So... Uh, from this, there's actually a few like things that were filled in afterwards as details. So first off, can you explain to us the role that basic heroes play in draft anger? Yeah. So um, if you if you draft shitty heroes basically, and you don't get the color you want with the the other cards you want to play or whatever, then you have the basic heroes to act as fillers. You can just put them in the deck, and you can have as many as you want. So you can have like three Rileys or two Keefs or whatever. That's insane and, to me. So it it makes it a little bit more forgiving if you if you get good cards but you don't get a good hero of the color to support those cards with, then you always have the basic cards. Um, as and the same reason. is true with items, right? So it's the yeah. the short sword, the leather armor, and I can't remember the name of the the cloak one, but it's the four health for like three gold or something yeah. like this. Right? And and a lot of people actually prefer those over the the drafted items because. Um, they're cheaper, and you generally want to prioritize uh, your your cards to, like the, the colored cards instead of items when you draft, unless you get something really good. And I think that that's an important point in the strategy of this because you uh, like when you're, for instance, like if you're posed with a pick that you're saying you like, let's say that you know you're already in in blue, and you have a decent blue hero and a decent blue spell. Um, because you know that you can always backfill with blue heroes, there's kind of a bit of disincentive there to prioritize the heroes uh, over the spells, correct? Is that how things out work out operationally? Well, it really depends on the hero. Uh, some heroes um, are so good in draft that you don't want to leave them. Um, yeah, but, uh, and like, okay, for example... Um, if you have the opportunity to get two Lunas, yeah. Like if you already have a Luna and then you see another Luna, and and Annihilation, like you you would, uh, you wouldn't take the Annihilation over Luna. Yeah, mm. and that's also one thing that's important to to mention too that we did learn is that you can get duplicate heroes in draft, not even just of the the basic ones, but of the. Uh, the, the specialized uh, ones as well. So one of the things that a number of people have said, I've, I've actually, you're talking to Action Jackson, he specifically said that he thinks that they should rarity shift Luna because she's so busted in draft. Like moving her to an uncommon might help balance things a little bit better because if you do get the two or three Luna draft, that that's just stupid. Right. Yeah. Especially because of how Eclipse works, right? Yeah, that's the, that's the reason why. Yeah. Is because because like each one of them builds up the charges on all of the eclipses. So by the mid game, you're just able to do eclipse, 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 and every one of them is board clearing uh, hmm. with you know you know maximum efficiency. So that's um, kind of a degenerate little you know interaction yeah. there that maybe we'll, maybe we'll see them change it. Maybe they they won't. But that's an interesting thing to note. There's uh, definitely the some silly stuff in draft from what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it, but it is something though that like I mean clearly heroes have a pretty big range. I imagine that heroes like like Axe specifically seems like really really good in in draft because just having a you know hunk of stats with a decent amount of armor is just going to be really hard to chew through through conventional means. So 
that will be something that you prioritize over a lot of other cards. But you know, beyond that, and also I imagine it depends on the hierarchy of which heroes do you think are better or worse. So I actually do want to ask you, uh, Anger, after playing in the beta and playing draft a little bit, how would you rank the basic heroes of which one is the best and which one is the worst? Because I think that that actually probably makes a pretty big difference in what uh, colors you prioritize and what heroes you prioritize. Yeah, um, I actually, after starting playing draft, I'm a bit more forgiving to the <laughs> to the basic heroes. Because, mm-hmm. like, for example, I think once I did um, three Rileys and I was able to, like, even, even though she dies very quickly, if you just get two Rileys hitting the tower, that's, like, 18 damage. Yeah. Um, and, and also her signature card isn't that bad. And, uh, and uh, Keith, you know, he's, like, a... A, a little um, bit worse axe and axe is tier yeah. one so keith mm. is still, he's not tier one but he's still you know he's he's still pretty good and and farban who i actually probably prefer in constructed i think he might be one of the worst ones in draft oh really um, but um but i'm not sure if if everyone agrees on that i just feel like if i'm gonna play green in draft like because him compared to Enchantress and Triant is just so underwhelming. Uh, mm. Whereas Riley isn't that underwhelming compared to Phantom Assassin and Sorla Khan. She basically does the same thing. And like they both have very low health and high damage. But mm-hmm. Farban is just too weak compared to Enchantress and, um, and uh, Triant. Mm. Um, but I don't know. Jamoy is. I don't know. I, I haven't made my, up my, my mind on him yet. He's trash, but his signature card <laughs> is. is Almost worth it. Like it's it's so good. There you go. Making sure that uh, your blue heroes don't die the first round. Like if you, just just for a signature card, and like if you're lucky and get compel and uh, cunning plan, um, and and if it, in draft playing blue is very difficult in my experience because yeah they're just so they they have very small bodies, um. But uh, yeah, I, I actually like Jamoy. I, I'd say maybe the best one is actually Jamoy. <laughs> there you go. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so I'm actually finding that it, like surprising because one of the things I've seen from, maybe this is just looking at it from a constructed perspective, but it seems as if there's a lot of these blue hero signature cards that end up being some of the you know, finishers uh, of for these decks. So something like Thunder God's Wrath, even from the gameplays that we've seen, has a big impact on the game, especially when you can chain them together instead of a big team kill. So I would have thought that, um, yeah, that that's just where a lot of the power level of blue is coming from in Constructed is the, these signature cards that are in this sort of range. So it's surprising to me to hear that Jamoy um, you know, fits that that role. Uh, are there? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you could probably f- answer this question. Like, do you think that there are some good blue finishers that are available in the draft format? Maybe we've seen them before. Maybe we see them already, or maybe we haven't. But that that actually like draw each other color because I always am worrying about with with blue decks is just the ability to finish the game. Yeah, uh, I actually, I actually did a mono blue in draft once, and I won. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, oh. I think, I think I did, I did Prelex, Kana, uh, Jamoy, Venomancer, and Ogre, I think. And I just, I just uh, took down an ancient because there was so many nice. creeps. Yeah, so kind of like a token then, strategy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but but other than like that was just a rare case. I think, and my opponent was probably a little bit unlucky, because uh, I think most of the time, blue needs another color to be effective, um, in draft, and and in constructed too, of course. But like especially in draft, some people have said that blue might be the weakest color, or uh, certainly oh, not really? the strongest, like in constructed, but um. Yeah, yeah, I think that people have... I've heard that the most, but it's also something that I get the impression... Maybe this is a, a good point to, to ask you. Like, how close do you think these are? Because this is something I talked about, actually, when I was visiting the Back to Base podcast, is the the difference between what's the strongest and what the weakest is in a given draft format is very different. For those of you who know Magic the Gathering, I know that you guys don't know very much. This would be a little bit of gobbledygook for you, but that, that, that's fine. Um, the, the There's one format that was very famous uh, that was called... Uh, Battle for Zendikar, that 
green was the worst color, but it wasn't just the worst color. It was unplayable bad. Like some of the best players in the, the game were saying, you do not draft green no matter what, because it's, it's just unplayably bad compared to, to the rest. And then there's other ones that you're like, okay, maybe, maybe green is the worst. It's still fine. You can still put together good decks, assuming that you have a couple of bombs and you know how the color works. Um, and, and it's actually you know, a conversation. So how would you characterize that in terms of the differences of the power levels between the four colors? Well, I actually think it's pretty balanced because, um, I don't know, uh, I'd, I'd maybe say that green, red, while it's the easiest and safest, I feel like it's the weakest. Like It's the one that I, when I've played it myself, I feel like I can't really do much. Um, mm. And playing against it, it's, it's easier to win. But other than that, like, because... With in draft, it's not just that you are at a disadvantage because you have to you know draft cards, but the op- opponent too. So he doesn't have always have answers. Like for example, annihilation. He doesn't necessarily always have anni- annihilation, yeah. even if he has blue. So you can you know disciple of nevermore and do swarm strats like that, and you can yeah. overcommit into a board, and you're not going to get punished for it very often. And and yeah, yeah I, I think most yeah, I think it's it's really balanced. But um, I would, uh, yeah, I, I dare say that red green is the worst. Hmm. Uh, Simon, I, I've been taking up a lot of questions. Do you have anything to, that you want to ask about this? Um, give some well, place to you. First of all, I'd like to point out that I totally called uh, Jamoy being good because of battlefield <laughs> control. He said, Just, he you know, said that bringing she, it he's back. Fine. Only he said that she's fine. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made up my anyway. mind yet, and the like, only I reason mean, this is going to be happening, I, I wish to be prepared for this for the rest of time. Any time <laughs> some guard that we shit on sees any amount of play, yeah. Simon's going to come in here first thing. Okay. Like, King folk rifle made a top <laughs> bait. Taste it. Mm, okay, let me, just, let me just <laughs> set a few things straight. Okay, the King folk musket is trash. Wing commander <laughs> is trash. Vesture of the tyrant is the best. So suck on my huge dick. <laughs> oh. Okay, okay. So uh, let, let's, let's focus here. So what are the questions that you do have? Uh, go back to that. Um, have you ever had a case of being completely outdrafted right away? Yes. <laughs> Once I played against three Legion commanders, <laughs> it was just mm-hmm. genius. Oh, shit. <laughs> he just kept killing all my heroes, <laughs> just jewel all the time. Yeah. And there was nothing I could... I think I, I had blue or green blue and green i think and like he just completely destroyed me right away there was nothing i could do oh really um but also like double drow is rough um yeah but but usually that's what i like about draft compared to constructed that i feel like it's just you have so much more opportunities to win and i I think uh draft games generally are longer than other games too because they're 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 more balanced because both players are worse you know Mm. Mm. um i think one thing that really surprised me coming out of this is how common heroes seem to be overall now that we know that one hero is guaranteed in every pack but the the problem is that sometimes like if you want to gamble for a good hero so uh the first pack you open, you get something crap, like mm. fucking Darkseer or something. I don't know. Uh, and then you, uh, you 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 continue to draft and you wait for a better hero, but then you don't get one until like the last picks, and turns out you get fucking I don't know. Another like, Darkseer. <laughs> yeah, More another Darkseer. Darkseer just whatever. Darkseer. And then yeah. if, if Darkseer is part of the two last cards, then you have to take it. And then, yeah. but then, it turns out you don't have any green cards, so you can't play your darks here. Then you w- mm. would have to supplement with a basic hero. Yeah. Now, th- I do want to go back and talk a little bit about the items because this is one that I think is even more exaggerated than this—the hero effect. Because we did talk before, um, it was my time after our time of playing TTS about how we identified that cheap items in your shop are often really good because you have the freedom to buy multiples of them if you have a lot of gold. But if you have a little bit of gold going to the shop and being presented with a baller expensive item, you just can't do anything with it. So I, I've heard Swim specifically talk about uh, that the idea that you really deprioritize buying or drafting items because the, the basic items that you get 
are actually really solid and they're so cheap too. So, you know, like maybe you get something that's really dumb. Like an investor of the tyrant we know is kind of stupid and, and it's power level. So maybe if you see that you're going to go to your way to pick that. But I, I expect that for the most part, you draft those very close to the end of the pack. Is that correct? Well, I wouldn't say, okay, in draft, I wouldn't say you always take Vesture of the Tyrant. I think if you if you have already drafted some good black money cards, then maybe mm. you go, or, or if, you, if you're running black red or something like that, then maybe get Vesture of the Tyrant. But even, like, even then it's still... Maybe something like Blink Dagger is a better example because that was yeah. pretty affordable and pretty powerful and I think that most decks would want to have access to that. That's probably one of the few that's in that category. But outside of that, like, do, would you say that most of the time you you very rarely draft um, expensive items because of this effect of the basic items being so good? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Blink Dagger and, um, yeah, of course, Stonehall Cloak. Maybe Stonehall uh, Dagger, what's it called? Mm. Stonehall Pike? Pike. Pike. Maybe. But I, I really overvalued Stonehall Pike. It's not as good as I thought. Like, even mm. even just the short sword is might be better for, for the value. It's half right. the price. Yeah, yeah, price is, is king for that, and that's something that we've definitely seen in spades. Now, one thing I do want to note that uh, we don't have any confirmation about, and I know that Anger can't speak about, is about signaling. So for those of you who are coming from a card game background, especially a Magic the Gathering background, I'm just going to give a little bit of um, just uh, downloads, a bunch of stuff on, on the subject of what we do know and what we don't know. Uh, we actually don't know basically anything about how signaling works. So signaling is a phenomenon where you're basically able to read what, cards are coming to you so if, if you're drafting with other people maybe they're drafting the red cards a lot so you're not going to see very many red cards and you be able to figure that out and say like okay well i'll prioritize my blue and my green and just assume that red isn't going to come so as of right now we don't know whether you're seeing cards that there's there's somebody else who's specifically passing the cards to you whether these cards are chosen through some sort of algorithm of a, a computer or, mm. or what exactly is going on there right now. So that's something that needs to be uh, solidified for us still. So we, we need a little bit more information to actually speculate on that. But as of right now, just a little bit of information that we do have does suggest that signaling isn't very important in, in draft so far so we'll have to wait to get more information about that and sort of what that actually implies though yeah i'm just looking forward to seeing how many mind games there really are in drafting itself yeah yeah but and also one thing that you mentioned before the the cast is that we uh simon is that we do know what your opponent's deck is uh, yeah. At least in the, the the tournament mode, it seems like that because uh, there were some people who were mentioning it was like, oh yeah, my opponent's deck is so crazy. They have you know so many copies of this thing or whatever, which seems important for prioritizing your own choices in draft. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, now that we talked about draft, uh, let's talk a little bit about the tournament that happened this weekend. I know that Angry, you had a chance to participate in. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about uh, that experience? Because I think that you had an interesting time. <laughs> yeah, interesting indeed. Um, I went. Uh, I think I went two and and six or something two and eight i, I can't even remember and one of the wins was a free win because oh, i didn't nice. have an opponent <laughs> oh the bye yeah. the bye i like it <laughs> well you won your first game though you won your first game right yeah i did yeah. and and i got super overconfident i was like telling everyone i was gonna crush everything <laughs> and win the tournament oh. and i just lost pride comes so. before the fall but you know, it you know, it was it was, I got RNG fucked, you know. It was all oh, RNG. Yeah. The creeps all didn't RNG. Oh, yeah, that was all RNG. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know the right works. things. How can my win my deck win against this? He got the perfect cards right when he needed them. Mm, yeah, man. <laughs> it's 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 feels feels bad, man. But I actually do have I am interested to hear about just the experience of, of the tournament. Like it was a it was a pretty long day from the sounds of it, right? Yeah, it's it's really fun to compete. Even if I'm not that good, it's nice to you know play a little bit with the big boys and uh, you know uh, test out you know and 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 uh, I I have already learned a lot and um, and uh, yeah. So I, and it is something though that I also uh, we we knew that the the person who won over the weekend was Lucas Blohan, who is a pro tour winner for Magic the Gathering. Seems like there's a lot of Magic players who have been doing very well in these tournaments like Stan Sifka also um, Magic 
uh, Pro Tour winner in addition to that. He's been more famous recently for his Hearthstone work, but he also has a history in Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And your boy, uh, Swim, he went 5-2, uh, and two, I believe. Risk. He got oh, nice. pretty far. Very nice. He did, did he make the top eight or not quite? No, he barely missed it. You Feels two Batman. faced up against each other as well, didn't you? Let's not talk about that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'll get I'll get him on in the future and and, and talk about that. Uh, that, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, get the other side. That encounter. So that's, uh, is there anything else that either of you wanted to talk about or ask about a draft uh, before we move on to something else? Not really. I'm just looking forward to seeing how we, you know, fill these holes in our knowledge. I I must say that draft is so much fun. It's it's mm. so much fun. Yeah, a it's lot like, of people said it brings, that. It brings another aspect to the game, you know. In constructed, like you you have everything planned out, you have perfected your strategy. It's it's what everyone knows is good, right? It's solved. But in draft, you have this the spontaneity of you you have to to improvise when you see the cards you have to think okay do i take the hero now or do i wait you know it's it's great <laughs> and you have to plan ahead what he, what colors you want and you know and then you you start playing and you see your opponent has two drows and three lunas <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you cry yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's something too that I think that for for you, you haven't played very much in the way of card games before. But and it's definitely something for for me about you know played a ton of card games. Like you really appreciate how much the the drafting element and you you, you like ask these questions like okay, so how greedy can I be and different things that I can fit together in the same deck or what are the strategies that I like to the double down on or underappreciated etc. And that element of of the game is a lot of fun and the the really. Uh, improvisational deck building but when you're saying though about the fun i think actually ties in very well to our next topic that we want to touch on which was about some of the reviews that we're getting from a couple of uh, particular beta testers uh particularly mm-hmm. Raynad and and noxious have said recently on online that they are not interested in really pursuing artifacts to any degree because they were saying that they just don't really find the game very fun um which, I mean, it's fine for some people not to like the game. It's not necessary that everybody likes the game necessarily, but I know that you guys had a couple things that you wanted to say sort of in in response to, to this. Um, so maybe yeah. let's start with, with Simon. What, what was it that you wanted to say? Well, the first one that came out was uh, Reynard, who um, was on stream with, I think, uh, Safjay. And uh, he, this was really the first time that Reynard was talking about Artifact much at all. And it was interesting to hear because uh, he started out with the whole Artifact is bad thing before he, you know, softened it up to just not fun for me. Um, He did say it was really well designed, that it's revolutionary in some aspects. He said it looks fantastic, etc. But he kept referring to heroes as just a big pile of stats, basically, and how the combat really only comes together as like a big math equation where it's just about numbers. You raise stats with uh, plus three or something, and he said that's just not exciting to him. Um, And I think he's just not a big fan of the Dota flair. Um, On stream, he was playing Magic Arena, and... He was taking an example of this uh, phoenix-like card where he's like, you can look at this card and you can see it's a bird, it can fly. Uh, You have the whole cultural reference of a phoenix, so you know that it revives. And there's your flavor, you know right away. And meanwhile, he's like, okay, so this hero has retaliate. I can give him plus three retaliate. And to him, that's just not fun. Like the basic maths of it. Um, isn't for him. But Noxious said something similar as well, though he went more into the direction of Artifact doesn't deliver on the MOBA fantasy, which honestly, Gabriel already said that it's not supposed to be like the Dota 2 card game. It's supposed to be a card game which uses the Dota 2 world for convenience, basically. Um, So I don't think that it actually tries so much to deliver on the MOBA uh, fantasy. So I think Noxious went in there with like different expectations. 
Um, but he also had similar criticisms about heroes just being a pile of stats rather than characters that he can identify with. He says that he doesn't really feel like he quote unquote played axe when he can use red cards on any red hero, basically. So he feels yeah. like there's a disconnect with the identity of a hero when you can play that hero's signature cards with another red hero, for example. Like, they did bring up a couple good points, I think, but to me it just sounds like they their issues are mostly with the basic set of artifacts. No, um, I'm sorry. Their problem is that they're <laughs> fucking... They just want to play fucking RPGs. Yeah, like, yeah. Artifact isn't a fucking RPG, neither is mm -hmm. Dota. It's not about having a hero and playing its yeah, story. Yeah. Like, if you want to play a fucking story, go play Skyrim or fucking <laughs> whatever. I can see it, yeah. Watch a movie. Uh, I, did, I did disagree with a lot of what they were it's saying. It's not about but... the story. It's about beating your opponent. <laughs> Says the, it's about uh, winning. It's about having the superior numbers. Said the law expert. <laughs> um, no, uh, I definitely agree with you. Like Some of their criticisms just felt like they were looking for a different game. I think it's also worth to keep in mind that Reynard is actually designing his own card game currently. So I think just seeing more competition may not make him completely objective in that regard. Uh, I mean, and in that respect... Like, like on that level, thing specifically, I don't think that that's like necessary. You, that could be a part of it. That could not yeah. necessarily be part of it. I think that I know have known personally, in and seeing everything about Artifact from the beginning, is I've always thought this isn't a game for everybody, and yeah. and and I don't think that Dalf thinks this is a game for everybody either. But it doesn't need to be. Yeah, you know, in in some respects, I think that it's it's just, it feels like it's designed for people who are more interested in chess than in they are interested in Hearthstone. Yeah. Because, because in, in some respects, like it, it is true that these cards like often do function like balls of, of, of stats that you're trading back and forth. And even things like saying like, Oh, I trade off my heroes uh, and I, I get my hero to die in order to reposition them, etc. Like it does seem to kind of contradict the, the idea of the, 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 the Dota experience. Cause you never want to die in Dota. And so you know, like those sorts of ideas, like yeah, it's it, it's true, but you can still have a compelling strategy game without maybe necessarily quite the level of of flavor for it. And especially, I think that because of the the underlying mechanics of like the underlying game rules of Artifact are fairly complicated, and just in terms of like a, like initiative and three boards, you know, et cetera, you know, like there's a, like a whole you know, market component, you know, like the shop component. I'm not surprised that most of the mechanics and abilities that they've given to heroes and units so far are fairly basic. And I think that that's a great place to begin with for the game because if you in addition to this added on a number of you know weird flavorful mechanics uh like like stealth or poison or like 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 you can imagine a lot of these that they could have used maybe that ends up just being way too complicated as a beginning state for the game um a anger what are your thoughts well like like you said i think that artifact isn't for everyone i think it's it's uh, like okay, I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> lay shade on anyone, but like, Hearthstone doesn't seem to me like a very, like a game for strategy gamers. Hmm. But Artifact is one hundred percent a strategy game. Like it's 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 a card game, but I feel like it's first and foremost a strategy game, and mm -hmm. and it it also has like. With it's not just the strategy within the game; it's also within the draft. And a lot of people are um, talking shit about uh, the RNG. And while I do agree, sometimes it really fucks you up. But I also think that part of the game is that you need a strategy, you need a plan, but you also need the ability to improvise when things don't go as you expect. Like being able to deal with with what you have, and. And I understand that some some uh, Hearthstone players and Dota players don't like this pure strategy aspect. Like they're they're used to more fluff. Uh, 
but I think for for those people who are kind of autistic about strategy, it's the best game ever <laughs> created. <laughs> Well, I think that most of the criticisms will be alleviated by future expansions as well. Um, because we actually saw an email by uh, Richard Garfield on the subreddit as well, where he talks about how they actually had to delay or postpone some uh, mechanics that he wanted for the base set as well to the first expansion. Um, because they wanted to keep the base set like simple to introduce you to all the mechanics and all the stuff that uh, Artifact basically revolutionizes. Um, and I'm sure that things will get crazier with death effects and play effects later on as well. Yeah, and I think that one of the th one thing I harp on a lot, and I actually wrote an article. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see this one. Uh, it was on eleven paths for the future of, of card games, and I'll link this in the description as well. But one of the things that I, I I've kind of been thinking a lot about this because there's a, it's a, there's a whole interesting space right now of what's happening in card games. I mean, there's artifact that's coming out. Magic is going through some weird dramas of their own. Hearthstone Ooh, yeah. is feeling kind of stale to a lot of people mm -hmm. um, as well. So given this this environment, there, there, we are interested entering this really interesting phase, what happens with the genre. And one of the most likely outcomes in my mind is actually entering in something like a a golden age of card games where you have all of these different you know, viable titles that are all interesting in their own right that have different things that they're offering people, especially because I think that there's more people than ever having different ways to get into the genre and getting interested right. in it. And but one of the things in that that I kind of concede is that like, I don't expect Artifact to go head to head with Hearthstone or Magic in terms of raw numbers of people playing and people watching. The, yeah. And the thing is, they don't need to in order to be successful. What they need to be in order to be successful is have you know, a, a decent sized player base who's passionate and and maybe it's just like smaller but sort of more intense. Like they they pull off some of the hardcore people from from Hearthstone and this can build a a nice competitive scene and a, a a solid player base. But I think that a lot of people have this vision in their minds like well, if you're not you know taking down Hearthstone, you're not going head to head with Hearthstone, then you're not successful. And I just like that is a bit of a misconception that is. Uh, that, that I think overly simplifies the way in which this you know, the world works. Because there's a lot of card yeah. games that exist online that are perfectly successful, perfectly profitable, that are a lot smaller than Hearthstone. I think that, Ar that Artifact is going to be pretty big, relatively speaking, but it's definitely, it, don't expect it to you know, overthrow Hearthstone as the king of card games, uh, digital card games, for quite a while, if at all. Yeah, but d didn't you hear Neon? The market is oversaturated. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, there's, there's, I feel like there's a lot of demand to go around, and um, but yeah, if you definitely are interested in, in checking that out, I think there's a lot of different possibilities. Those, those are just my personal take on things. But uh, check out that article uh, if you are interested. I also think uh, one important detail is that card games are pretty easy to get on mobile and tablets, mm. so yeah. it's also going to appeal to the kids, you know. Our fellow kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the kid the kid lums. The kid Um so excellent. So with that, how about we move on to talking about some of the most recent cards that have been revealed to end things out for the day. So we're going to of course start with the hero cards, which are the most important of the ones that we have seen. Uh, the one that we are going to finish up talking about because we hadn't seen uh, all the parts of it so far, but we had talked about a good deal of it, but previously is Beastmaster. This is a 512 red hero, has the ability Call of the Wild, which has a three turn cooldown, and it summons a loyal beast, which is a 3 3, uh, 3 1 3, rather, for, for three costs, but technically doesn't matter, but um, three costs, technically. Uh, the, and when loyal beast deals combat damage to a unit, modify that unit with negative one attack. So that's the same rule as Ursa. Mm. So. This is one, and, th and then the premier card that we have is Primal Roar. This is a seven cost, once again, red spell. And what it does is it stuns a unit blocking an ally red hero this round and then moves that unit's allied neighbors to random other lanes. That's the big one. Yeah, so I, when I first saw this, I was like, this. it's hard to know how to evaluate this, especially because it's hard to... Like the signature card 
seems really situational. Like you, there, you have to have things lined up properly, and and like the positioning is so so relevant, and et cetera. And then people told me later on, it's like, no, this card is really really good. Um, yeah. So uh, how how about we start with uh, with you, Anchor? Tell us a little bit about this card and what your thoughts on it are. I actually really like it because if the enemy in the lane has has two heroes next to each other, you can basically silence him by taking one out of the lane and stunning the other. And um, his his uh, doggo is also quite nice. I mean, it's it's not super great, and because uh, the the cooldown is maybe a little bit long. I don't know. I just feel like his ability is not very good, but his signature card is definitely good. He's not a tier one in either constructed or draft for me, but he's he's decent. I think that looks really strong to me. Uh, I mean, we have already seen uh, Nick Tasha's guard, which has a similar effect of throwing units into other lanes, win a game once. Uh, that was on a pack stream. So I think that Primal Roar can be extremely powerful, especially with what we've seen Stun doing before as well. Like, you can't use that hero for anything anymore. Yeah, I'm really interested to play this out because I, I think that I at first un underestimated what that moving stuff to random lanes effect felt like. And it's the way that I kind of see it as being soft removal in, in a certain way because it is disabling the heroes that would be available for that. I think that you probably have to put a little bit of effort into building your deck to take advantage of this. Maybe go a little bit lighter on the creeps so that there's a little bit less... You have different possibilities of where things will will line up. Maybe uh, I can also imagine this in something that's a little bit more of like a tempo focus deck. Uh, maybe also you could pair this with something like uh, ramp effects mm. in order to get that out earlier, and then ch maybe chain them together in order and, and other sorts of disruption effects in order to stop your opponent from really doing anything for a while. I mean, you can only do that for so long. Yeah, but maybe there's enough that you can do to knock them out of a given lane and did you screw up their plans that you can set up a pretty big advantage. But I think mm -hmm. that there are certain situations where throwing enemies into other lanes is actually preferable to removing them, especially mm -hmm. when it's heroes. Uh, because, yes, it is a form of uh, soft removal, but you also deny them like the refresh from the fountain, for example. And if you throw them into other lanes and you manage to, like, let's say you play this on the third lane, then they don't get to use those uh, heroes or those units for that round at all. Okay, so the next hero that we wanted to talk about is Darkseer. This is a green hero. He is a 5'9". He has the ability Surge, which moves another ally to another lane. And that what that means exactly is a little bit unclear. Um, but like like whether it's you have to move another ally to a lane that isn't the lane that they're in, or versus the, moving them to a lane that isn't the one that you're currently in. Like we don't we're not. Yeah, I, it's the latter. I, I I think that that's probably the case. And his signature card is Ion Shield, which is a four cost green spell that gives retaliate three. Um, my initial reading on this is that it is in incredibly mediocre and <laughs> just like slow and clunky and like i mean i guess his base stats are fine but outside of that like there's just go i mean situationally there'll be times that this stuff will be good but it's actually mm -hmm. retaliate like retaliate is just not that powerful of an ability in a lot of cases it's i i feel it as being strictly worse than plus three attack in most situations. Unless you're being attacked by multiple things, I guess. Yeah. So I, I feel as if, like if this was plus three attack, modify, um, I don't know, I'm, I might be more interested in that. But even then, this is just a, a, there's nothing exciting to me about this package. It definitely doesn't contribute to any strategy that I can pick out. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I Simon, feel what like, do you feel? I feel like this. Tell, one... tell me how great this is, Simon. Tell me, tell me how <laughs> magnificent Dark Seer is. Oh, you don't even know. No, it's, <laughs> no. Uh, I gotta admit, this one doesn't seem uh, too strong. You gotta really look for some uh, niche constructed stuff, maybe combo. Like again, you said it. Retaliate uh, really only hits hard 
when you can get several uh, units to attack your unit, which you may not want to do. Um, mm -hmm. Like, the strongest thing that you can put retaliate on is your tower which we'll talk about in a bit i'm sure mm -hmm. and i think that also specifically the break point of three retaliate versus four retaliate i find frustrating on this one because having four retaliate means that you could take down creeps that are attacking something which is is nice but three is just like that last point doesn't feel like it does a whole lot under a lot of situations i'm not sure Maybe that's just a little bit uh, naive of, of position. Is that a correct reading in your mind, Anger, who, who's actually had a chance to play with this? Yeah, I think uh, one guy told me that he he made a deck, uh, a retaliate deck. <laughs> so he would have Centaur, Warrunner, Legion Commander, and Darkseer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the, the item that gives retaliate and like, yeah, you get a lot of retaliate, but <laughs> what's so what? It doesn't do anything. You <laughs> come, at buddy. come at me, bro. The deck. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. But uh, yeah, that, definitely not one that is particularly impressive. One that looks like a better green hero in my mind is Treant Protector. Mm. This is a 410 that uh, once again, green hero and has the ability Branches of Iron and it gives Treant Protector's allied neighbors plus two armor and has the signature card of Rosalief Druid is a four cost two six that gives your tower plus one mana. Now this doesn't look insane, but it looks fine to me. Yeah. I really like it actually, especially in draft. I really like Triant Protector. Um, I mean that two armor has got to be pretty decent. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's really good. Some people say Enchantress is better because she has regeneration. Hmm. Um but I, I actually really like Treant and especially if um the the rose leaf, leaf uh druid also yeah. isn't half bad either. Um, yeah, because this is actually one of the few mana manipulating cards that seems pretty damn good to me. Because it's a four mana drop, two attack, six health. And you get the nice bonus of that plus one mana on your tower. So you can get your big spells out around earlier. I think that is situationally really strong. Well, and it just seems like a great way also to control creep combat too, because having that two armor on your creeps on round one is mm. going to be really nice to start building a bit of an advantage that way. Mm. And especially in draft when things are slower paced, it feels like a great way to, um, you know, build on the board, uh, develop these small advantages and incremental advantages over a course of turns of like, okay, first your your creeps don't take any damage and your opponent's creeps do, so you have a bit of a board advantage that way. Then you build some mana advantage because of the, the, the druid, etc. And then you're able to then turn this into, I imagine there's a good a reasonable number of, you know, seven, eight, and nine drops in in green that you can use to to close out the game. Yeah, so definitely. So this... It seems like a really good you know, role player in that kind of deck. Mm -hmm. And Treant Protector himself just has a pretty decent body with four attack. I mean, at least he can clear out creeps. Yeah, that's the important part. Yeah, yeah. The, the difference between four and five is, is less, much less important than three yeah. and four. Exactly. So the fact that he has that four is is really important. That's the magic number. Yeah. And one uh, card that I think kind of synergizes well into that kind of strategy would be the Rose Leaf Rejuvenator, which is another one of the new cards that we got in the most recent week of reveals. Yeah, loving uh, these Treant designs, by the way. Yeah, um, the really, I, I like the the, the Treant world. They're, they're interesting set of creatures. Uh, this one has some a pretty baller red hair on it, which <laughs> I, or pink hair rather, so, so very punk of it. So Rose Leaf. Fucking weeb. What's that? There <laughs> Fucking weeb. There it is. <laughs> Uh, I know. I mean, I like it. I, I'm, you know, back in my. Have you groups. ever? Have you ever seen a tree do the Naruto run? <laughs> I, have, I have not. I, I that's not something that's come up in my my days. But Rosalie for Juvenator, seven drop seven seven heal your tower for seven, and uh, but as a play effect, that seems like I, I like that package of cards. To me, makes sense as a draft strategy of defend yeah. yourself, build up a board advantage. Um, maybe your tower gets a little bit low, play out the Rosalie for Juvenator, maybe turn early because of the, the Druid, etc. And it's going to be really hard for decks without hard removal to battle through that. 
I'm loving yeah. the 7777 aesthetics yeah. here. Just really satisfying. And I think that's really high value, honestly. Seven, your term? I think that's good. I think it's I think it's okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's like a tier one draft card, but but it's 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 okay. And and I'm starting to change my mind um, on on like healing your tower because Swim has some really good thoughts on that. That in artifact, it's much more important than in, for example, Magic the Gathering, which you probably know more than me about. Um, but in artifact, I f I feel like healing your tower is 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 actually like it it can actually help you you know more yeah, and it can actually big. help you win i think it can be pretty big. i haven't really made up my mind on him yet i i think he yeah he's he's decent i mean this is one of the things that is also about the the like, cards in draft is like i mean obviously amazing isn't what i would use for this like this isn't a showstopper this isn't a bomb it is a very solid inclusion in a good number of decks like I mean, this is definitely something that we're going to get more into as we get closer to the, the full reveal of the, of the set and talking about actually evaluating these in you know what you want in a given uh, draft deck. But I mean, there's only so many seven drops that you can play in a deck. And if you have ones that are better than this, then you would play them. But a lot of the time, this is going to be a very reasonable card to fill in some of the, your deck. But it definitely I've heard some other people say that the, the way things will sometimes work out is your opponent sets up lethal on a tower and has like clearly been planning this for a couple of turns. And then you play something like the Rose Leaf Rejuvenator, block one creep, kill your tower over seven. And now the math has flipped that it's no longer in their favor. Yeah. So I think that um, the, the, like that does cover all of the heroes, the new heroes that we have, but we have a handful of other new cards that we've seen over the past couple of weeks that we haven't had a chance to cover yet. One that Simon was referring to earlier was Burning Oil, which yep. is a red improvement that gives your tower plus two retaliate. Now, why were you interested in this card? I think this has is the most useful card I've seen that gives you retaliate. Because it puts it on the tower, which is the primary goal of the whole game. And this is actually really useful against decks that go wide, like zoo mm. decks, etc. Especially those with, uh, with creeps that have very little health. Like I feel like this will be very useful against um, Prey on the Weak, for example. Kana's a big flooding card. Mm. Um, and it's only one mana. I think this, yeah, this is super high value. I think that this is a card that would, to, to my, my reading, would probably depend more on the metagame because it is so good against go-wide types of strategies, but against something that is relying on more burly units or units that have a decent amount of armor drops off in value really quickly. Mm. So I definitely think that some red decks are going to struggle with go wide strategies because from what we've seen so far, blue has the vast majority of the AOE effects and red doesn't have that. So if you need to have access to something like that, this, this does work, mm -hmm. but there's going to be a lot of other situations where this does virtually nothing. I think if you manage to play it early, it will definitely be worth it anyways. Again, it's one mana, and if you get to play it early, that's still two free damage on uh, most creatures. Yeah, it's 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 decent in draft, but uh, I don't think I would put it mm. in constructed. I suppose you would draft this as like a tech card, just so you know, just so you have something against decks that go wide in case. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't. I actually don't really like red that much in draft. Ooh. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, there's just yeah. What have you done with the red? There's one? just better combos. I'm sorry, but I don't like red in draft. So, so, so what, like, I don't know if I ever got the the full ranking from you of what you thought of the the, the different colors in in draft and what the, the how they stack up. You said maybe green is it'd be like green, black, red, blue. Maybe is that what you would say your order is? Uh, hmm. I think okay, green, black, and blue. Uh, maybe maybe blue, blue, and black are my favorites. Even even if some people think blue is bad, I actually really like blue. In in draft, so blue. 
Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, but the thing is, blue and and black not combined with with each other. Okay. But with other colors. So so blue and green I really like, and black and green I really like, and also blue and red I really like. Okay. Cool. But uh, but I would say yeah may- maybe actually red is the weakest. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And why is that? You think? I don't know. I just feel like. I don't know, cause I just feel like I do. I don't get to do much, and I get outplayed every time. I just get, um, what's it called? What's it called when you hit hit an in Dota when you hit an Ursa from afar with a ranged hero and he can't do anything? Kite. What's that called again? Being kited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just feel like I get kited, you know. Hmm. Interesting. And I can't do anything. But um. I mean, I guess a lot yeah, of their um, their common cards and their generic cards, the, there are a lot of them that seem expensive and don't do a ten. They do have a couple of big, beefy units. Like I think that the Ogre Conscript is one that looks like it'd probably be great in draft, but uh, there are a lot of other ones that are kind of mopey. Okay, I think I actually know why. Okay, so in constructed, I like red because you have guaranteed Legion Commander, you have guaranteed Axe. Sure, but in draft you don't necessarily get the best red heroes. And I think maybe that's why I don't like it as much because the reason why I like red is because of Axe, Legion, Commander, <laughs> and Centaur, Warrener. Hmm. Cool. But so if, if I get them, then maybe maybe I would like red more. But if I don't get them, I don't want to play red in draft. Speaking of red, I suppose we could call uh, talk about the Omex Arena. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this yeah. one? Um, the shitty arena. Oh, really? Well, this is a six mana red improve. No, oh, yeah, improvement, which says draw a card after a hero dies. I think this can be useful, but uh, I think like only situationally. Uh, I also think this is not too good of a card. Like more. <laughs> yeah, I'm just we'll thinking about things like comboing and with brawl and hoping for the best. <laughs> well, I think that with this card, to me, like my my issue with it is um, compare this to foresight. Well, grant me foresight that. draws you two cards for four mana. So, in order for this to come out equally, you need to have two heroes die. In order to come out ahead of that, for which is what you would hope for, for six mana, you need to draw three cards. Three heroes dying in a lane, like, takes a while to do. That's just going to require a lot of stuff to line up well. The only application of this that seems like it would make sense is, like, maybe you put this in a lane ahead of time, and then you immediately annihilate that that lane, or annihilation that lane, um, in a blue-red control deck. Uh, that requires a particularly intricate setup um or maybe there's some other way that you can uh, you know, really set this up continuously but i just really worry that it's going to take you so long to get your value from this and it's going to be inconsistent it's like six mana is so much too yeah i think actually you're right this could be really good in control like if you have three blue and two red because mm. you can then plan ahead if you have a lot of blue heroes then you might know, okay, so in third lane, I know two of my heroes are going to die and one of the enemies is going to die. So, so you place it there. Because it's, it's, also, it's also for your own heroes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that you would, you would definitely want to enter a control deck, I think, in order to, to really to maximize it. Because you do need the game to go on for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe Centaur Warrunner is another good one to, to combo with this because he yeah, kills himself so effectively. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Perhaps that's why he's featured. Yeah, yeah. Um, other cards that are new ones. I know that uh, Simon. If there's any of them that you know that uh, are are new that you wanted to come up with, then I'd love to to pull those out. But I know I know that it's hard for Anger to pull them out because she's not necessarily totally uh, on top of what is new and what's what's not. So uh, I'm not going to ask her um, for one card. I, I I don't think we have talked about. Have we talked about the cursed satyr? We have. Um. We have, but maybe you have a new opinion of it now that you've had a chance to play it. I love that card. Oh, really? It's so good. Okay, yeah. so this is the 6-6 six, six for 5 in red that gives your opponent a zombie at the end of combat, just for people who don't remember what it does. So why are you liking this card now? 
because if it dies, it doesn't summon the zombie. So you can use this if if a hero, if an enemy hero has six or less health and six or more damage, you can use this to take out a hero. Yeah, this was something that I think I was talking about on, on a previous cast. But not just... You, you can just block them and, and take so out So you hero. just use her as a scapegoat. So. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's the thing. She, she's, she's, she. You can also always oh, scapegoat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can also because you can also. It's very flexible. You can also use her to finish off. Like if you, if you, if you're missing six damage to take down a tower, you can put her down, and it doesn't matter. If she summons mm. a zombie because it was enough for lethal. Yeah. So I don't know. I really like it, and a lot of people disagree with me, but I really like it. <laughs> and now, is, is this for a draft? Or in draft, of course. Draft? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in constructed. <laughs> well, I mean, I also imagine in draft that you probably value that gold income a little bit higher too. So, so just mm. having a little bit of like yeah. a constant income for it could could be nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another red card that we actually haven't had a chance to talk about, and I've been seeing people talk about it a good deal, is enough magic. This isn't a particularly new one, but uh, I just wanted to touch on this now because you'll have been talking about it uh, more. Five cost, red spell, proceed to the combat phase so just totally skips over your opponent's action phase and anything that they have the chance to do and goes immediately to, to combat it seems as if this is a good way to block your opponent from doing things and is a, is a interesting way to seize initiative and manage initiative as a red player because you don't have like I mean, this is something that someone's talking about is that you don't have a lot of tools to do that and there's there's so many ways for both black and blue to fuck you um if you give them any amount of initiative whatsoever so this is a way to like it, it's not a particularly good card in and of itself but it's it shores up some of red's weaknesses hmm. at least that's the impression that i got about it um i don't I, have you been yeah. thinking about this one at all simon um, I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot, uh, enough magic, especially because uh, Garfield said it was his favorite card so far. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, I just think it's really fun to break the rules of the game a little bit and just say, nope, you're not going to get any uh, counterplays here. We're done here. I'm okay with combat right now. <laughs> I think that's a really fun thing to do, especially for Red, who have yeah. shitty spells. <laughs> and it, does this one see play in constructed anger mm, yeah i yeah i mean i don't play much constructed i because i love a draft so much <laughs> uh, but I, I would definitely put this just to uh, make sure i don't get annihilated and i also really like tidehunter and his signature card is one mana and it gives you initiative mm. and this is five mm. mana so you you can use that at the same uh round as annihilate so you can use the Kraken Shell to make sure, like if you have to save a hero before you proceed to the combat phase, you can do that, get initiative and then enough magic and the opponent can't use Annihilate. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really like it just as anti-blue. Maybe you're going to start to hate it now that you have suddenly become an entrenched blue mage from the sounds of things. <laughs> oh, the mighty have fallen. Yeah. Um, were there other ones that you want to talk about, Simon, that, that stuck out to you? Um... Yes, actually. Um, I would like to talk about Lodestone Demolition. It cool. is a three mana black spell with the following effect. Deal damage to the enemy tower equal to the total armor on enemies. I think this is mm -hmm. really interesting and potentially very powerful depending on... like We've already seen an armored cleave deck for packs. I'm sure that there will be decks that uh, are based on amplifying your armor stats, etc. And this is like the perfect counterplay to that. I, I mean, you need to deal a lot of damage for you to be willing to play a pure damage spell in your deck. The fact that you can't play this against anything other than the enemy tower is one of my big concerns mm. of something like this. Like, like one thing, for instance, this is a three-cost spell. Yeah, Three-cost spells... Part of the reason that they're so good is that you can play them on turn one. You do not want to play this on turn one because it is going to not do very much damage unless there's something very strange going on mm -hmm. in the, the the course of a, 
uh, of a given setup. Like if your opponent is, you know, plays, uh, plays an axe card and then goes crack and shell, crack and shell, crack and shell on turn one, then you can deal <laughs> five damage to the enemy tower. Like mm. you did it. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I mean, like you want to play it in a later game, but I mean, I don't really feel like it's taking advantage of the cheapness of it. And I, I just feel like a lot of these pure damage spells, unless they're really rocking your opponent's world, I, I'm pretty soft on them. Right. I suppose I am just really fond of the idea of that one situation where you <laughs> really get to throw all that armor back into their face. Like, they're stacking up, I don't know. We already said that Farvan is pretty mediocre, etc., but... That's what I'm thinking of, just area, armor, effects, etc. And just throwing that back in their face as a counterplay. Like, obviously, with three mana, you better make it worth it. Does this see any play in aggro decks that you've seen so far, Anger? Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anyone play that card, honestly. <laughs> oh my god, I picked out a rare one. <laughs> An exotic one. Exotic. Um, I, think, I think I had it in my... My meme black deck, oh, which nice. was one hundred percent just it siege, the memes. like everything was about siege and tower damage. I think I had it, <laughs> but that's the only time mm. I've seen it. I just love situational cards. That's the thing. I love, I love using. But they're bad. bad. Cards at the right moment. <laughs> they're bad that's because they're situational. I think that what you seem to like also is screwing people for their strategy, like interrupting what they're doing. Yeah, I've seen, I've been seeing a lot of that. Like you especially really like the deny your opponent mana cards as as well. And yeah, uh, that, that that's <laughs> one that uh, along that same line, I, I can I can see. I just like disrupting other people's plans. That's mm -hmm. actually why I really like control decks, etc. I like stalling. One card that I did hear is pretty decent in draft it, that uh, falls into a similar line um, is the Smash Their Defenses. Three cost red spell. Condemn an improvement and then draw a card. I love that card. I love it so much. I mean, there's a lot of great improvements that we've seen in the, the game so far. And I'm, like, I'm imagining, for instance, your opponent is playing Aghanim's Sanctuary, for example. They play Aghanim's Sanctuary, mm. expecting to be able to activate it and play something else. And then you go smash the defenses, draw a card, and they're blocked from their next play. Like, that seems really annoying and, and powerful. And it just feels like almost every deck is going to play some number of improvements from what I've seen. Yeah. yeah. The only problem is if um, if the enemy doesn't have any improvements and this is starting to, if you have three, and then starting to take a lot of space on your hand um, and you want to draw those cards, you know, there's yeah. no yeah. way unless you actually kill your own improvements if if the enemy has none. So that that's the only issue with it but i've never gotten in a situation where i have not been able to use it i think right it's like oh no my oath isn't working <laughs> out <laughs> better cast it in this lane oh wait it doesn't work because of the oath um <laughs> but, uh, the... <laughs> oh no i didn't think far enough <laughs> exactly <laughs> I, I i thought about that application for myself too and i was like no it doesn't work a blittering orb actually does work for that application if you are interested in, in that play, that's a pretty niche application of that card. But is this also then, I mean, I don't keep on asking this, but I am uh, always curious. Like, this is, you know, this seems like it's worthwhile for playing in Constructed, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Super worth. Yeah. And it also means that you don't have to play something stupid like Pugna, which it <laughs> yeah. does not look spectacular in, in the face of something like this. It's just a low, low, low impact red hero when you need to get so much mileage out of your heroes is red. Yeah. A similar card in some ways is Spot Weakness. This is a red spell. Gives a hero and its allied neighbors pierce this round and draw a card. Pierce, I'm assuming, means that their their damage turns into piercing damage. Mm. Mm. Um, which seems like it has some situational uses. I mean, if this is something that maybe red decks just want to have some cycling effects, like if there's a a uh, combo deck that can decrease the cost of spells or something like this. Maybe this is the kind of thing that you would like to have access to. Um, like Also, if big armor decks do become popular, this 
could be a an application to invalidate that. I feel like Red has some better options mm. in the form of something like Centaur War Runner is actually really good at that because obviously the Red heroes have a lot of the armor, and then you have that double edge that you can use on your opponent's heroes as a way to get rid of their armor. So yeah. that that is uh, I I've, I'm less interested in this one personally, but it's an interesting card. I think this is... no, I actually I, I really like it because you can use it even if the enemy doesn't have an improvement. You know, oh, sure. it's much more flexible and and um, yeah, I, I I really like it because of the cycling reason and 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 sometimes it comes in handy. Like it's never not useful. You know. Okay, sure. And 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 also oh 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 versus vesture of the tyrant. Oh, okay. you need this versus vesture of the tyrant. Right. I think it's most useful if the enemy is putting armor on their tower because that uh, amplifies your potential damage a lot. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if there are any more cards that you guys want to just talk about. The one that I wanted to close out on, though, is a, a fun and controversial number, which is Wrath of Gold. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a fun one. So this is a three-cost blue spell. Spend all your gold, repeat one time for each gold spent, pulse, deal four damage to a random ally or enemy. So it hits all units that are in the lane. Uh, the damage isn't even piercing damage. And it, like this is one that I think some people have gotten really excited about, but I'm worried that this is going to be a really expensive way to do not a whole lot of damage. Yeah. This is definitely one of the more chaotic cards that we have seen um i think it's really fun probably like a must-have in every meme deck (laughs) um (laughs) other than that like here's the thing like people were talking about the fun they'll have with this card it's just hard to make it like super useful like the most useful thing you're going to do with it is if you have like a dying uh, about to die crystal maiden in a lane and nothing else, and you just want to deal as much damage as possible. Mm. Um, but even then, spending all your gold, oof. Like, you gotta... Yeah, and it also hits, like, you need to have a blue hero in the lane to cast yeah. it, right? So then, why would it hit the Crystal Maiden and not your hero, you know? Mm. So it's just not... It's, it's not hard the to make work. Taking. It's hard to make work. Like, uh, since it's not piercing damage, maybe you have some armor on your units to reduce some of the potential damage and hopefully make a valuable trade. But yeah, this is this is just chaotic and supposedly fun. I, I feel like if the, 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 there, were, there were definitely a number of ways they could have shifted this card to make it a little bit more competitive. Like maybe you could set the amount of gold that you were spending on it or it, definitely if it only hit your opponent's stuff, it would be a lot more interesting. But there, there just seems like there's way too many situations where this is going to do stone nothing. Mm. Uh, or be worse for you when you play it, that I am not interested in it myself. Jesus, take the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're feeling really lucky, this is this is something that you can use. Like, yeah, I have one gold, need you do four damage to one of their four units and just rip it off. Like, that'd be pretty sweet. But yeah. um, not going to come up in the average game. Mm-hmm. So with that, are there any other cards that you guys wanted to talk about before we head out for the day? Uh, just one more, if I may. And that sure. is the Cloak of Endless Carnage. This is one that uh, supposedly wasn't supposed to get revealed quite yet, but it did. Um, and <laughs> it is an item card for 13 gold. Um, a health item. Equipped hero has plus 8 health. Draw a card after an allied neighbor of equipped hero dies. I think this one is uh, pretty fun. Uh, People have pointed out that this could be useful on Lich, for example. You could uh, deny, well, sacrifice your own neighbor and potentially draw at least two, if not three cards from that. I think that this is a card that... I could see you putting this in your deck deliberately for 
Um, you know, some a couple of particular types of decks like that, or maybe a tokens deck. This is something like a Venomancer deck. Mm-hmm. It, it, that's interesting, but that's a pretty niche application of, of for it. I mean, like, yeah, I, I think that it could be good in like a like Lich plus Dimensional Portal plus Venomancer Kana, like that kind of deck. Actually, seems like okay as a one of inclusion there. Where I think this is really going to shine is in the secret shop, hmm. where when you get this at the, the correct time and you know that your opponent is going to kill something in a given situation, you have enough gold for it. You're like, okay, yeah, I'll get this. I get the free card. Yeah. And there's not a lot of ways for them to interact with it. And it's just kind of a value there. So, and there's a lot of unit of uh, items that seem to fall under that category that yeah. you're just like, yeah, maybe not going to come up you know, very often when I put it in my deck normally, but when you get it in the secret shop in the right situation, you're like, yes, this is the perfect item. It does exactly what I want. And there wasn't anything else that I was going to buy anyway. So go for it. Yeah. Well, the problem is that best case scenario, you draw two cards and two of your creeps die, you know, or two of your allies die. Like, the best case scenario means that two of your units dies and then you only get two cards. That's the best case scenario from this mm-hmm. item. And that just to me isn't worth 13 gold. Then there's other items I'd rather get. Yeah, that that and... is exactly why I wanted to talk about this card because it has an interesting trade-off in a way. Like, I suppose the cards are more like a consolation prize. <laughs> but uh, I, I always... Uh, I think the amount of gold that it costs is a pretty odd number. Uh, it's kind of a mid-range uh, item, uh, and it's actually below most mid-range uh, items that are like about uh, 15 or 18 before we get like in the 20 range. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, it's a bit unlucky. Mm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Again, like yeah. Uh, <laughs> just like the 7-7, seven, seven, etc., they're really going for some number aesthetic flavor here as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm actually really... Um, one of the things that I'm actually going to predict right now, actually, is I wouldn't be surprised if Vesture of the Tyrant ends up being one of the most expensive cards mm. in the game to, to, to buy because... Uh, one of the things that I've been noticing and thinking about and talking with people who are in the beta is that there's there are a lot of items that are used between basically all of the different decks. That the you know, things like the Stonehall Cloak or whatever are are common between um, most of the decks, and there's just a couple of items that really stick out as being you know, across the board better. Basically, Vesture of the Tyrant is one of those that really sticks out as a very impactful mm-hmm. card. Is is going to see play in a lot of different decks. Basically, anything that has any kind of econ related stuff. So that and that's a, a rare. This one, the the Cloak of Endless Carnage, is also a rare. But if it does see main deck you know, deliberate play, it's only going to be in like one or two decks as a one or two of. But uh, you're comparing that to Vesture of the Tyrant, I think, is a pretty big uh, gulf in in power level. Yeah. Mm. So with that, how about we close up shop for the day? It was lovely to have you both. As I mentioned, I have an article up on my site. You can find the link for that in the comments I just did about the future paths of card games. Also, lots of other content that's on there that you can check out. Simon, do you have any projects that are on the go right now? Um, I do, actually, but that's still in early stages of uh, script writing. But I have a a couple things in mind that will hopefully see release in just a couple weeks. Excellent. And Anger, I'm sure that there's some stuff going on behind the scenes that you can't talk about, but I know that you are still working on your Dota Geography project, correct? Yes, and it's almost done. The map is done. Now I just gotta, you know, make the 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 videos but it's it's kind of hard because i want it all I, i'm probably gonna make it all and then drop it piece by piece you know mm. so i get a good mm. nice you know full picture and uh, so that's why it's taking a bit long but also more important do you remember on our first or it wasn't part of the secret shop podcast but it was our first um video mm. together yeah yeah uh intro to I, I told you yeah, yeah yeah i told you i was gonna be you know the next Nicki Minaj, you know, <laughs> the next big female rapper. Yeah, yeah. And uh, guess who just uh, dropped the hottest track of 2018 the other oh, day? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely heard this one. If you haven't checked this out, I'll also put a link for that in the channel uh, about, you know, singing the praises of Mono Red and how they're, you know, 
smashing all the noobs, etc. It was, it was. Oh, I'm not singing. I'm rapping. Yeah, rapping it. Sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Nicki Minaj would be a red card. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but with that, though, I think that that's everything for today. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a lot of fun uh, on our behalf. Hopefully you enjoyed it, too. Be sure to like, subscribe, set notifications, you know, all that business. It was lovely to have you. Take care, everybody. Peace. Thank you. Thank you for your business.